Hello there, I'm Scotty, you're not. And since, uh, he who shall remain anonymous has decreed that I continue and or finish the Children of the Corn franchise, here we are with Children of the Corn 3 Urban Harvest. You see, back there is the is the case with corn and the broom. I don't know the broom, it's just there. Uh, so, okay, so this one was, so I think, I think they're getting better. The first one was okay, the second one was better than that, and this one might be better than the second one, I don't know. Uh, there, there has its merits. The story is, Two adopted brothers, Joshua and Eli, are taken from Gatlin after their father's death and brought to the beautiful city of Chicago, where Eli decides to grow his own special corn and hypnotize the youth of Chicago to try to make it like Gatlin. There's only Joshua to stop him. So first and foremost, I popped when I saw Eli because it's the little kid from Demonic Toys, the evil one. The one who was talking with the very adult, demon-like voice. Of, kind of like this, you know, talking like this. It's him, and I pop for him. And this actor is just fantastic. I mean, he was, he, his voice was dubbed in that, but he was good in this. He is great. He's not as good as John Franklin in the first one. Sorry, I'm itchy. He's not as good as John Franklin in the first one, but he is good. Uh, this film is the first actual appearance of Charlie Theron and Nicholas Brendan according to Wikipedia. I didn't see Nicholas Brendan, but I saw Charlie Theron twice. She doesn't have any speaking roles. But, you know. So, we start off in Gatlin, much like the first two. And, uh, these two are running from their father who's drinking again. And, Eli uses the he who walks behind the rows who manifests itself, not through corn this time, but just like stalks coming up, killing him. And then we cut to it's Chicago, and they're being brought into this, fo this, these foster parents. I don't know how two kids from Nebraska would be shipped off to Chicago like that. You think there would be a nearby town somewhere all the way to Chicago? Fine. I don't know. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, they went through the same foster system as Andy Barkley. I can see why they're all, it's all messed up. But, you know. but uh, they go with this couple, William and Amanda. William is works with corn because, of course, he does. I'm not exactly sure why he does, but he, he has something to do with corn. And eventually, Eli starts growing his own crop. In the back, which Amanda doesn't like. You know what I didn't like? Bugs. There are bugs in this movie, but I should have known. I should have known because it's sad. The special effects by Screaming Mad George, infamous for doing bug effects, like in Silent Night, Deadly Night uh, 4 and 5, he did the effects and there was bugs in that. He's infamous for doing bug effects and there's a bunch of cockroaches when Amanda opens up Eli's suitcase, only to find when. William opens it to find corn. Yes, although corn in a suitcase would have gone rotten during the transfer. I would smell, I'm just saying. But it's special corn. Yes, it's special corn. Because the corn, it's revealed in this one that the, if a child eats the corn, then they become hypnotized to follow Eli. But if adults eat it, they get sick. Hence why the principal, who is a father, so this is like Catholic school, I guess, uh, who is actually the uh, the hotel manager of the Cedric Hotel in Ghostbusters. But, uh, I mean, yeah, I recognized him too. I'm like, hey, that's the, that's the guy from Ghostbusters, the hotel manager. But, uh, so, you know, the kids eat the corn and they get hypnotized. Follow Eli 
But Josh Wolf figured out there's something going on. And even the social worker. See, if, if, if it's one thing I don't like, it's the same thing I don't like with the Omen. Is that It seems like you they been writing these movies and like they need to be like okay we need to have someone find out the truth but it's too early in the movie for them to do anything so we'll kill them off right away because a social worker tries to find out some stuff she she figures out some stuff and she's killed right away you know that Eli is from 1964 it's never fully explained. He just is. I don't know. And it doesn't make any sense if we're trying to connect this to the other two. Where the hell was he during this? I don't know. But each and every one of these films are not connected in any way, shape, or form. Because there's a, um, there's a cliffhanger here. And I looked up the fourth one. And there's no connection. Nothing comes from this cliffhanger at the end of this. I don't know. I don't know. But. So. Uh, Eli wants William to sell his corn. So that they can he can hypnotize more kids. You know, world domination thing for he who walks behind the ropes. Uh, Joshua, I mean, while starts to make friends with the kids around here. Including Malcolm and his Sister Maria. He and Maria get a little hot and heavy. He gets the second base. Touching the boobies and everything. Touch the titties and, you know. Uh, but much to Malcolm's chagrin. But he recruits Malcolm to go back to Gatlin to get Eli's Bible that was left behind. Leaving Maria behind. And Maria gets hypnotized because she eats the corn. I think it's very weird because it, it is a cut where he's like, hello, Maria. And in the very next scene, she's sitting at a table with him and they're feeding the corn to the parents, her parents and her parents die. So if, it, if an adult eats the corn, they die. If the kids eat the corn, they become part of Eli's group. Okay. And so they go to Gatlin and while there, they find the Bible, but Unfortunately, Malcolm gets killed by he who walks behind the robes. Uh, but Joshua makes it back to confront Eli and his congregation of people in the dark in a cornfield, because of course. But, and this is where I think the strength, this makes it better than the first one, because they do a better job of he who walks behind the robes, which it's screaming mad, George, so you knew it was going to be some good decent to good effects here uh joshua you know he surmises they get to destroy the bible and eli to finish it off so he does that but he who walks behind the rose rises up to kill all the kids that have followed eli and joshua and it is a great effect it looks really good it's like a giant worm serpent creature thing better than that weird stop motion broccoli thing from the first one it's much better looking and he's forced to kind of chop at it to free maria which he does i think and then he, that's done but it's not over because we gotta say we get a cliffhanger that eli's corn is being sold in germany which goes nowhere i looked it up goes nowhere this was Good. Good. I'll say it's good. Um, the acting at the beginning of the movie had me worried because the actors who played Eli and Joshua were like, I was like, eh. But then they get better, especially Eli. He really gets to let loose. Like I say, he's not as good as John Franklin in the first one. Again, pardon the squeaky chair. I can't help it. He's not as good as John Franklin in the first one. Is it? It. How was his name? In the first one. Isaac. as Isaac. But. He's pretty good. He, he kind of. Brings this character to life very well. Joshua. Well we don't really get to much with Joshua. We see him acclimating to his surroundings. Meeting Malcolm. And Maria. But. We mostly follow. Eli. 
right? And the foster parents don't do much either. Amanda's always scared. There's a scene where you think there's going to be a sex scene, and then she just starts throwing up bile, and it looks as if the foster dad is possessed, but it doesn't go anywhere. I don't know what that is. This woman gets tortured for no reason. She's barely, you know, she saw the bugs. I don't understand why she saw the bugs, because it, I don't know, she's supposed to be clairvoyant, like she can see through his I don't know. I don't know. Or were the bugs there to protect the corn? It's confusing. And she even gets freaked out about the corn, but I don't know why she gets freaked out by corn. Corn is wonderful! Corn! But, no, oh, and by the way, this, I'll bring it up. This right here, this cover, the cover they used for this collection, that is actually the cover for part three. That is Eli right there. That's the guy. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but, um, you know what? I was dreading going back into this. Alright, there's actually some decent effects in this. Like I said, Screaming Mad George. I kind of like the score. It's kind of dark, a little brooding. I like the Chicago setting. You know, we've been in the cornfields for the last two movies. It's a nice change of setting. I doubt that will change. But, it's a nice little setting. It's a small little cornfield in like a little area. But, it, it works you know? <coughs> God damn. Scusa. I sneeze. <sighs> and also, I think that the guy who's the father, the father, the, the principal guy, I feel like, I don't know, like I said, my big issue with this movie is that, uh, is that every time someone sort of figures out what's going on, they get killed right away because it's not time to to confront him yet. That's for Joshua. You know, much like with the Omen movies where someone says, okay, he's the Antichrist, I have to stop him. They get killed because we're only an hour into the movie and we got to keep going. Right, so the social worker finds out she dies. The principal starts to figure out what's going on. He dies. So, you know, and, you know, Amanda, the foster mom, she kind of has an inkling of something else going here. She dies. And the foster dad gets drunk and then is killed, you know, by Eli. So adults are useless, as usual, except for in the first one, it was adults to say they. Second one, too? Or maybe it was, that was a teenager guy. I don't know. But. but that was the father and son one. The second one. That one's not bad. Uh, I'm going to give this. You know what? I'll give it a very low. Pretty, 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 pretty good. I think it's pretty well done. The effects were good. The director was. James D.R. Hickox. Well, I think it's related like to Anthony Hickox, who directed Hellraiser th uh, 3. So, yeah, it's 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 not bad. I don't expect them to get better. This was 90 minutes long. Nice run time, you know. Next one's 84, which is shorter. Now, don't expect me to cover these all in a row. Like the corn in a row, corn row. Um, I might just, you know, wait a little bit. Um, I, I may do part four tomorrow. But I'm not promising anything. Uh, I'm just, I'm just, you know, trying to. Do I, I, I still have some 2023 movies to do too before the end of the year. I want to do. So there's that. But I, I just, I wanted something else to do, and this filled that time up, you know. But they'll probably be more spread out than they were, just because the Chill of the Corn franchise is out there as kind of. Not a very good franchise, so, yeah. Um, but I also, you know, that Children of the Corn remake, I need to do too, so, because it came out this year as well, I think. So, what are your thoughts on Children of the Corn 3, Urban Harvest? Leave a comment below, if you like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. I'm Scotty, and I'll see you in the next one.